in this segment things are going to get a little deep so bear with me on this journey. At this point while creating those simple four framed animations you'll start noticing your character breaking apart whether it is to do with improper sizing of your UVs, improper placement of rough details on textures, stretching of textures, balloon seam exposure, misplaced pivot points, improperly weighted verts, and the list just goes on. You can start noticing all of those issues even within Max's viewport. You'll have to keep going up and down the pipeline to solve those issues to the best of your abilities. Once you're happy with how the character deforms, only then start concentrating on putting your energy into texture creation. Even before starting a project, you have to know where your character is going to end up. Currently, at the time of making these videos, I suggest if you're going to create a character for games, then aim for exporting him into Unreal 4, Unity, or into Marmoset. In version 3, Marmoset has included the ability to view your animations. Knowing where your character is going to end up is crucial, because the approach you take in making your textures would be dictated by the final viewing package. Also before approaching texture creation, you need to know the light rig setup within your engine. As covered in texture first pass clip, because I'm working with 3D Coat, I wanted to try giving myself the most control. This meant creating selection sets for practically every element, i.e. sword, straps, rags, arrow bag top, bottom, etc, etc, just like I showed you in the first texture pass. What I stumbled across was, working within 3D Coat, masking out the layer still didn't give me the control that I wanted. Let me demonstrate what I mean by that. So to go over this again real quickly, these are pretty much the selection sets that you have in Photoshop. And again, every element is kind of separated out. Keys, shoes, fins, back, neck, every little piece. Rags, right? And then when you basically export that as a PSD file into code, then when you import it, you get, you get something like this. This is the same layer group from PSD, diffuse selection. So every element is, is there. And what you can do with this is, for instance, I want to paint only on uh, the sword, let's say. Same idea, same principle as with Photoshop. You basically, you control click on the layer. When you control click on a layer, for me at least, on my machine, it slows down a little bit. Now I can start applying paint on this sword. As a note, with your mouse you hover over a point and then you click F. And then what it does is it, it starts orbiting around the marker that you just set. So here for instance, what if I want to actually go in and paint part of that handle but because the hand right now is overlaying the sword I have no ability kind of to do that right so the same kind of idea applies for getting into those like extremely difficult uh, sp spots so to uh, deselect just just like in Photoshop control D it deselects and we go back to kind of the previous version of it. So same kind of idea, what if I want to paint within the back of the collar, the front, certain, or, or for instance, what do I do if I want to paint on the top part of the mouth? Or you know, like something like behind this, behind the straps, it's just, it's, with this kind of technique, with this method, uh, it's still pretty difficult. I mean, uh, of course those situations are rarer, but they will inevitably pop up when you have to get into a, a crevice and you're just unable to do it. At times even though I've masked out a specific area, it's still extra difficult to get into certain nooks and crannies of the model. Plus I notice that my machine slows down when you're trying to paint on, on a masked out portion 
of the model. To solve my self-imposed problems, I've separated my model into elements. Uh, let me demonstrate that as well. So, working with 3D code, I find this to be a kind of a better approach to creating your selection sets. And that is to basically separate out all the pieces of the model. Now as you can you can see, for instance, this is the top part of the mouth, of the inner mouth. So now I can actually get in, into that area. All the pivot points are set to zero, zero with every element. And uh, I went in and I just put a name to every single piece. Then what you want to do is you select it all, you export select it as an OBJ. And when you export it as an OBJ, you preserve the texture coordinates with it as well. What happens is when you do bring it into 3D code, now you have this ability to, by going into the paint object, now by alt clicking on the icon, you're able to select only that specific element of the model. If we were gonna go for, let's say, mouth top, I can isolate that out, and now I have my, uh, mouth top to work with. Same thing with a, with a sword, right? Now I have the ability to paint on the handle without any uh, without any imposition. In 3D code, make the texture canvas the size of 2048 or 4096. Now that if your final texture is going to be 1024, then it's better to double the size to 2048. Then when finished, downsize it back to 1024. This idea is based on the pixel compression algorithms, which means that your 1024 will still maintain its crispness, and the edges should maintain their full opacity without introducing half pixels or anti-aliasing. That's why, for instance, it's better to have your normal islands flattened down with a flat normal layer, because if your normal islands have transparent space surrounding them, then upon downscaling, all the edges of the island will be susceptible to half pixels. That's another reason why having padding is so important. Uh, let me demonstrate this idea. We often find ourselves in this kind of situation. Uh, in both of these examples, the texture size is 1024 by 1024. And let's say we want to enlarge it. I mean, shrinking and enlarging is the same kind of idea of different algorithms of course but inevitably the outcome is the same it's always it becomes very smooth around around the edges blurriness uh, ensues so the idea of having your let's say your island your in this example the, the normals are basically are merged with a layer underneath a flat normal color here the normals are on its own layer with transparency around them. The point that I'm trying to make that if we decide to enlarge the image to let's say 4096 just to demonstrate the, po the point, but here's another idea. You can select uh, bicubic smoother for best enlargement. Automatic, I mean it's, it's always set to automatic um, or to the neighbor preserve the hard edges, but in my tests, I really haven't found a solution which actually uh, helps me. I mean, one of these outcomes might be a little bit better and is better, but it's just it's still not enough to actually keep the crispness. So I, I just usually I, uh, I don't even worry about these settings, and I just keep it on the automatic. And then we when we enlarge it, we can tell that it got less sharp got wonky we started getting this kind of this halo effect around the islands uh, but in this situation uh, if we were to perform the same exact operation and to 
enlarge it by the same amount, then we can start seeing that if we now control click on the islands, there's some half pixels that are outside the border now. So kind of the idea is to preserve your selection sets with this kind of technique. I mean, that, that, won't, that won't work. And my argument is, if, you, if you're gonna enlarge the image by that much, well then might as well just merge it and be, be able to preserve kind of the crispness of the edges, even though it's, when you enlarge it by that much, then, you know, everything gets kind of lost. But in my tests, 2048 wasn't enough, and in 3D code, I've increased the size of the texture canvas to 4096, which already means that my final 1024 normal map will lose some of its crispness. But later on, I'll explain how to avoid this issue through a different approach of texture creation. If we go back to the example that I just showed, we've enlarged the image. But usually the case is you're always going to be uh, downscaling, downsizing, and shrinking the image. Because what happens is you work in uh, different packages, ZBrush or Coat, let's say, at 4096. And uh, in the viewport, everything looks extreme, extremely clean. I guess here's the issue. To have small details, like such as pores or little scars, you gotta up the texture uh, size up to 4096. Even 2048 won't, won't cut it. 4096 is an extremely large texture and is usually used only for up-close cinematic uh, shots for characters. Uh, but in, in, in gaming, it's becoming more prevalent, but usually people still stick with 1024 or uh, 2048. So the idea stems from if you start painting your micro details on 4096, then you can downsize the image to let's say 1024, and then still kind of maintain the, the crispness of it and the detail information. But in reality, it doesn't really work that well or at all in the in the example that I just shown we've enlarged but the principle is the same when you shrink the same thing will it goes through the same uh, algorithmic procedures right so it's it's almost better to kind of go about it in a totally different matter of creating your micro detail for for uh, for your character and I'll I'll talk about it a little bit later you'll have to go into the properties of each gradient layer and then specify to which layer you'd like to clip the gradient to. So it, it's, it looks something like this. For instance, in this kind of situation, we have our leather armor G, which is the gradient. Because I've already cleaned it up, it, it really doesn't make a difference, but if it came in kind of the, the sloppy way of working, then you would have to go in you select your gradient and then you go into the layer blend tab and then here under the clip masked layer you specify to which layer you want to clip so it's already clipped currently so that would that would work totally fine but i mean going back and you know doing that for all you're losing time in your pipeline and 3d code getting the most out of your selection methods. I, I still, I, I think I just prefer the, the whole separation of elements on the, in Max or in Maya, on the element mode. So now having all these pieces definitely is, is much easier for me to work. Plus when you select one thing, it's not as laggy anymore. It kind of deloads the, the other vertices in the viewport. So you can actually work much faster, much quicker. Also, the thing with separating the elements out, you start noticing the, the these seams. These seams are kind of visual misrepresentation because it's just a sh pretty much a shading error. Because if you have the same color for the top and the bottom, th there shouldn't really be a problem when you export it when you collapse it all and export it back into your Photoshop or, or any other package.